this is Nathan Stuke uh, from Whisper and Whisper University. And uh, today we're going to talk about engagement and ownership. Um, I, I think engagement is one of those buzzwords, um, but we're going to try to demystify that and talk a little bit about what that means and, and, and then go into ownership as well. Um, but today, you know, as you guys know, I always like to share a little bit about something about myself, and I have some pretty exciting news. Um, so uh, my, my wife and I um, are, run a swim team. We started the Seahawks a couple of years ago, about three years ago. And, uh, you know, with this whole COVID thing, we, we, we didn't have a swimming pool to swim in. And it was, um, you know, we're all locked out of swimming and, and what do we do? And so we looked at it and said, OK, well, what if we ordered an above ground pool uh, and put it in a 25 yard pool? Um, about the time we would get it in, because it took a couple months to get it in, we would be back into normal swimming, and that wouldn't really do us much good. Uh, but if we ordered a 50-meter pool, uh, that would do us a lot of good, because ultimately the kids need to train. If you know anything about swimming, 50-meter pool is the competition size pool for the Olympics. So that's what we want to train in in the summer. Uh, most of the 50-meter pools are outdoors. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a picture kind of uh, of our journey. Uh, long story short, uh, we were the first ones to order um, uh, an above ground 50 meter pool. Uh, think of that $300 pool that you can get at Walmart, which apparently you can't get anymore because they're all sold out. But uh, the $300 pool at Walmart, uh, put it on steroids and make it 162 feet long uh, by 32 feet wide. Um, so here's some pictures to kind of show you that just talking about it doesn't kind of give it justice. So uh, this is a piece of farm ground uh, that we, we own, a farm, an old farmhouse and a field. We had to do a lot of dirt work uh, to prepare. It was raining so much that there was just uh, the ground was soaking wet. So we had to, to bring in a lot of extra lime and do some work on it and, and build this pool uh, out there. So we built a flat area, a flat ground put in some of our, our roadways to be able to turn on. Um, and then that's the pool down in that tiny little box down there. Uh, and, and it's really, really cool how we were able to roll this out. Uh, we got an army of volunteers on the hottest uh, day of the year so far. It was like 95, 97 degrees. We we're all sweating and dying, uh, but it was worth it. These are a whole bunch of swimmers from the, from the Seahawks and their parents and some college students as well uh, that are on the McKendry swim team came out and did that. And, this is us kind of putting it together, laying it all out and pulling this massive sheet out. Uh, and you can see how big this sheet is. It's just absolutely huge, 162 feet long. Uh, we got it all set up that day, took a lot of, lot of work. None of us really knew what we were doing. And we, we found out the night before we went to set this up, that this was the largest pool this company has ever built before, the, the longest one. And it's like, wow, that would have been nice to know a couple <laughs> a couple weeks before when we were planning, when we were asking all these questions. Uh, but it was good. But we, we used the pond next to us to fill it. You can see how it was a little bit of green. We filtered the water before it went in. Uh, and then we had to do vacuuming. And that's uh, kind of what it looks like today. Uh, so I, I've got day two of training in it. My uh, wife and I, plus a couple of the people went out this morning. The swim team has been officially practicing in it the last two days. And we still have decks we have to build around the bottom and the top side, the short sides plus some pool house and, and, and everything for the pumps. We're running just temporary pumps right now. Uh, but I'll, I'll share some more, uh, more pictures uh, over the, the different um, uh, broadcasts that we're doing, just so you guys can kind of keep up with that. If you have any uh, swimmers uh, on your, in your family or people you know, are happy to share information about the company, how to get one set up. Uh, I know it's really, really important to have pool space, and we're, we're real excited to, to be able to, to share with people what we did, the solution we came up with. Um, as always, I want to make sure you understand you, de you, design, you, you define success. Um, if, if you define your own success, uh, and I don't mean settle for, for just settling, but, but if you define your success, you will always be successful. If you uh, let other people define your success, you will always find somebody with a bigger house, more cars or something, or in our case, maybe a bigger pool, right? Uh, and uh, we, um, we, we definitely want you to define your own success. Uh, the other thing I'd love to do is ask questions um, uh, during this presentation. I'm happy to stop. Uh, um, I'll, I'll read them, see what they are in the chat, and then I can answer those. So please, I'd love to make this interactive. I wish we could do more of a, a verbal interactive to be able to ask questions, but um, please definitely ask questions if you have them. Uh, so today we're going to talk about engagement, and, and this is an interesting topic. It's a topic that we've literally been talking about a ton as our leadership team, and 
what you know what is engagement and why do we why do we care? Um, so if you ask any owner or manager if they want engaged employees, you know what do they say? Yes, absolutely, yes. I want engaged employees. And you say, okay, well, why do you want engaged employees? What does that do? Well, engaged employees are more productive. They treat the customers better. They show up for work more. It means they're not as they're, they don't have absences. Uh, they come up with better ideas because they're always thinking about uh, something, thinking about how to improve things. They're a positive influence on others. They're more enthusiastic about their role. And the list goes on and on and on and on uh, about why engaged employees are, are better than, quote unquote, not engaged employees. So when you when you talk to business owners and you and you hear that, then you must think, OK, well, everybody is probably spending all of their time trying to get their employees to be more engaged and, and better engaged. And what is that? Um, but it's a little a little concerning. If, if you look at the statistics, you know, Gallup says 85 percent of workers around the world are not engaged at work. 85% are not engaged. Wait a minute. If, 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 if we all agree that having engaged employees is super important and, and they work better and they, they, you make more profits and they take care of your customers better and all those things, it's unbelievable to me that 85% of people around the world are, are unengaged. Um, and then you say, okay, well, what about the U.S.? Well, at least we're a little bit better, Right. Um, that's uh, 67% are not engaged. I know it says uh, no engaged, but not engaged there. So 67% are not engaged. Um, so if you say, okay, well, Nathan, I don't believe those statistics. Those statistics are, you know, you can make statistics sound like anything you want. Uh, well, let's look at it this way. Only 12% of people leave their job for more pay, right? So a lot of people think, oh, they left because it was more pay. And that's an excuse that a lot of people use Right. When you when you ask them why they're leaving, like, well, you know, it was a better offer. I got a lot more pay. That's 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 the easy answer for them to give when you really boil it down. Only 12 percent leave uh, because of better pay. And then when you say most people, it's the vast majority of people quit a boss, not a job. Right. So they, they quit uh, working. They don't want to work at a company because of the person they work for, not because of the job. Uh, so that's that's something that you know. If you don't believe me in the engagement numbers, go look it up. There's even more statistics all about all kinds of things. Um, so our leadership team said, no, in, engaged employees are really really important. Um, so we started looking at what does it mean to be engaged, right? What does it what does it mean? And we went around the table, and everybody had to talk about what it meant to them to be engaged. And we had very differing views. Very differing views. It was quite interesting. A leadership of nine um, had had very different views as to what um, what engagement is. Does it mean you go to all corporate events, right? If you, if we have a holiday party, are you there? Um, if we have an after hours event, like at the at the local bar, um, do we do they go there? Um, if you have an opportunity, what what does that mean? Um, let me see. Oh yeah, so that, that's a good idea. So uh, put in the comments what you think engagement means. Um, that'd be great if, if you want to put in the comments down there as to what you think engagement means. That would be perfect. Um, is it showing up for work? Right. That was one of the, the the things we had was we just we just want people to show up on time to work. Right. Does that really mean they're engaged, or does that mean they just are able to show up um, uh, for for work? Uh, does it mean that they have to be happy-go-lucky, right? Is it, are we looking for this person that's skipping around the office all the time with this giant smile on their face and saying, hey, I'm in, uh, you know, this is great. The weather is wonderful outside. And everybody's like, it's raining or it's snowing. And they're like, no, it's wonderful. We needed the rain. Uh, so I think that's something that when when we talked about it, the other one that did come up was married, right? Well, engaged means you're, you're, you're going to be married. Uh, it's like, oh, okay, well, does that mean you're going to marry Whisper? And, and what does that look like? And we talked about all of those things. And what we found was that it, it was different for each person, but only slightly different. On the surface, it looked like it was quite different, right? Some people said, yes, you should come to all the company meetings or a couple of company events. 
those were typically people who were outgoing and enjoyed those those events. Uh, and then other people said, no, I don't care if you go to the events. I care about the product, right? How is your work? What happens to your work? Is it good work or is it not? And we said, okay, well, that's fine. Those are typically being more task-oriented people. Um, but even if you did good work, are you still engaged or are you just doing what was asked? Um, so we looked at and we kind of boiled it down to the fact that for us, being engaged means you, you must have action. There has to be some kind of action involved with being engaged. Um, do we expect everybody to go to all the company functions? No. Some of our employees live pretty far away and it's just they can't bring their family here or some of them don't like doing that. Whatever reason it is, that that's totally fine. Um, but there's an action that has to be done. And those actions um, are working on Whisper, making Whisper better, doing your job and, and doing your job well uh, is a, a sign that you're engaged. And you can say, well, wait a minute, if I have a disengaged employee, I can see that they're still doing their actions, um, but maybe they're not the right actions. You say, okay, that's easy. I'll define that as the right actions are what they have to have. But it's more than that. We've had multiple employees that, that did a lot of actions and they did their job and they did it actually fairly well. But the attitude the attitude in which they did their actions. So it's it's not one or the other, right? It's not that you have to have a good attitude or you have to have good actions. It was that combined your actions further the company and your attitude is for us, what we're looking for is people who are, are have a positive attitude, not a happy-go-lucky attitude, right? Not a always bubbly and, and everything's going well, but they have to have the right attitude because it's one thing if you get it done it's another thing if you get it done begrudgingly. Like my kids, they're required to do laundry and they have a rotation. One week they do uh, darks and then another week they do lights and, and they have, my wife has a whole plan for them and she does a really good job of planning that out. My kids don't have a good attitude about it. They get the action of getting laundry done, but it takes them three days to get it done. My wife has to hound them. They, we have to turn off electronics and threaten them to get it done. So while they're still getting the action, they're not actually engaged in getting the action uh, done the way we want them to be engaged. We want them to have a good attitude about it, solving um, the problem and, and working towards, hey, I, I yes, maybe it sucks I have to do the laundry, but you know what? I have to do it. So what's the best way for me to do this? And how do I get my job done to, gr to add to the greater cause of the company? Another thing I found in some of my research is Another way to talk about engagement is the emotional connection with Whisper or the emotional connection with your company. Do, do your employees have an emotional connection uh, with what's going on? And that's some, sometimes that's when we talk about that is that that's um, you know, a higher cause. What is the higher cause? Whisper's higher cause is to create opportunities that make a difference. Yes, we provide internet access, but we're creating these opportunities that make a difference. And we're building into our people. And that's something that is much, much larger than just the product that we produce. Um, and sometimes it's easier to have emotional connection with, um, with our cause than there is to have with our, of our product that we provide. Um, our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal, this is our you know, stretch goal. Our 10-year ten, goal is to get to 500,000 subscribers. And we're about 18,000 right now. So we have a long way to go in 10 years. Um, but that's what we want, 500,000 subscribers. But it isn't just enough to say 500,000 in our mind. You know, in, in the U.S. especially, a lot of big companies say they want, you know, they, they want market share. I want to be the biggest or I want to be the top two or something. And I have 22 million customers. Awesome. But all your customers hate you or 50% of your customers hate you. So we have it that our BHAG is that we want 500,000 subscribers that love to whisper, love to whisper, or that are engaged in whisper, or are emotionally connected with whisper. And you might say, well, that, that's crazy. How do your customers love something, right? How do they love a company? Well, we want them to be engaged with us and engaged for our customers are that they tell others about us. 
that they come to our rescue on on uh, social media when somebody says, oh, Whisper's horrible, it's not working, and they say, well, mine works perfect. Maybe have you tried rebooting your router? Or you, all you have to do is call them, uh, and they'll help. They'll take care of you. You know that that's an engaged customer, a customer that is that is understanding of that. If we have an outage, um, that we're working on it, and they're not just threatening to to leave because they love interacting with us. Sure, we like customers to come to our annual appreciation party and our tower parties, but again, that's one side of being engaged as opposed to the whole thing. So we are looking for 500,000 customers that love to whisper. And we get to define what it means to love to whisper. And we, we do that by asking the customers and looking and seeing what we want uh, customers to, to, to interact with us. And if you think about some companies that you love, um, you act differently with them than you do with maybe uh, other companies. And that's the same thing we want with our employees. We want employees that are engaged. And I don't want to use the, the word to define it. You say, well, what is engagement? Engagement are employees that take action with the right attitude to further Whisper's goal, uh, our goals and our niche and get us to our BHAG. That's what we're looking for. Uh, another way I look at it is I want employees that think about Whisper in the shower, right? That they're like, oh, oh, that'd be a great idea. Let me, let me, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I was thinking in the shower, maybe we could do this a little differently or maybe we should do this. I mean, that's an engaged employee. It doesn't have to be every day. It doesn't have to be all the time, but that's somebody who is thinking instead of just rote doing what they had to do. Like I just do my task. I only do what I'm told. I'm actually saying, well, wow, maybe there's a, another way to do this, or maybe there's a way I should, I should help this customer and go above and beyond um, what I need to do. Because the way we set up our company to allow our employees to be engaged is through our, our core values, right? So we document 20% of our, of our actions to get to 80% of, the, of, of all, all the things that you'll run into as an employee, 20% documentation gets you 80% there. And then the last 20% is using our core values. And that's a way that we empower our employees to be able to make the right decision for the circumstance that they're in. Um, and a, a disengaged employee will sabotage that, or a non-engaged employee will just be like, nope, I don't know how to do it. It's not in the manual. An engaged employee will say, huh, I need to take care of my, uh, my customer. And in order to do that, I need to figure out the best way to do this. And I'm going to use my core values because it's not in the manual on how to do that. So that's the outcome of having an engaged uh, employee and something that's, that's really, really important. Uh, for us, and I think it's a buzzword, but back to those statistics, not enough people know how to actually actively engage their their employees. So now let's talk about ownership, and you, you can kind of maybe interchange engaged and ownership um, a little bit. Um, you can you can say, okay, well, you know, I want my employees to take ownership of their role, um, and you could say that's almost the same thing as being engaged in the role, but it, but it's slightly different. And I have some examples to kind of show you uh, of what ownership and what what I mean. And and I think the best analogy, and I got this from Don uh, Mushell, uh from the Troy Maryville uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, she's just an amazing person. She she comes in and does uh, does does training for us. And this is something that she had said that I kind of latched onto. This is from years and years ago. Um, the difference between renters. And, and owners, right? So if you rent a place, it's like, oh, that's a rental, right? That's a rental. That doesn't matter. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't care about the rental or I don't care about the car I'm renting. But if it's your car and you own it, there's a difference. Uh, so I'm going to list out a couple things just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So renters thoughts, you know, what's in it for me? I'm only going to do this if there's a return on my investment. I'm not going to do it for the greater good. I'm only going to do it for that. Um, another thing they often you'll hear them say is I don't do that job. Well, I, I saw that it needed to be done, but I don't do that job. Um, one of my examples is, um, you know, when when you're walking out in the parking lot and there's a piece of trash on the ground, um, renters step over it, owners pick up the trash. No, it's not their job to pick up the trash. Chances are it blew in from the field across the way, but it's something that needs to be picked up. And while it's not your job to go take a trash bag and go clean up everything, you happen to be there. And it's interesting to see people when they step over it like they have to make a conscious decision there to step over it. It's like, wow, if you made that much of a conscious decision to step over it, well, why didn't you just pick it up? 
Uh, the other thing that renters think about is they say, look, it's 4.55, I guess it's time to go, right? They're, they're packed up, ready to go. They clock in, clock out, right at exactly at the right time just because they, they, that's what they're thinking. They're clock watchers. They're always looking at the clock, trying to figure out when they can, when they can leave. Um, you know, it's been a long day. I need to cut corners to get this job done. So their, their goal is just to get the job done, not to get it done right, not to take care of the customer and not to prevent problems and, uh, later. It's just to say, yep, I got that job done. Um, I think this is right, maybe, oh, well, right? They don't care about what's going on. It's just kind of like, ah, it's there, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if I did that right. I don't know if I followed the procedures, but eh, no, nobody will find out. And if they do, I'll just tell them, well, I, sorry, I, you know, I'm, I must have been busy that day or something. Um, they also ask why I'm not moving up in the company. Uh, this one, you know, you have to be uh, an owner in my mind to be able to move up uh, and you have to be willing. The people we're looking for are the owner people as opposed to the to the uh, renters and the renters will sit back and blame it on everybody else. Well, I'm a victim here. Why, why was I passed over? I don't understand what's going on. They can't see that it's, it's their attitude. Um, I know this one never, anybody on this call, I know you guys don't do this, but <coughs> oh, I'm sick. I'm sick. I think I'm going to stay home today. Right. You know, I've got a couple extra PTO days and I'm going to use them or I've got my four sick days and I'm going to use them. Um, you know, it, it definitely, uh, I, I'm sure you all know of someone who's done that. Um, but I, I think the way it really sums it up, and it's what I talk to my kids about, you know, when they say, oh man, I have to go to swim practice today. I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to go to swim practice. Just because your mom is the head coach, um, we have the pool in our property, we're not going to force you to go to, to, to swim practice. So here's the same way, man, I have to go to work today. Uh, and that's that's basically the thoughts of of a renter is that they are there to collect a paycheck, and man, I have to go to work today. So now let's shift gears uh, along the same same mi mindset, and let's think of what the owner's thoughts are. So how can I help the team, right? How can I be a productive member of the team? That's what they think instead of what's in it for me. Um, not not just what how can I help the team, but how do I do more with what I'm what I'm capable of doing. Um, I do don't do that, but I can help. Right? This is this is the re retort to that's not my job. Um, this is hey, I see a need and and I need to get it done. And I know as companies grow, sometimes you create these silos where, well, that's your role and don't step on anybody's toes and everything. When you're smaller, sometimes it's easier to wear five different hats and and be able to to do that. And as you grow. And you can see it as people grow, the companies grow, people become more dis, disengaged or they don't want to step on people's toes. And hey, if there's something that needs to get done, let's talk about it and figure out how you can do that. Um, look, it's 5.15. I need to finish up, right? I mean, the day just flew by. I didn't even realize how, how much I was working. I got a lot done today. And let me, let me wrap this up so I can get to my family uh, as opposed to, to uh, clock watching. Um, this one, the next two kind of go together. Uh, you know, I need to complete this job uh, right the first time. And, and that's where it's not, uh, I think it's right, maybe. Let me double check, right? Let me let me ask somebody, let me call somebody to figure out, did I do this right? Instead of just leaving it for somebody else to find. Uh, how can I better myself uh, to be selected to move up? Uh, this one, you take ownership of your role and you say, hey, how can I do a better job to make myself a better person to be able to, to have the opportunity to move up? as opposed to playing the victim. Um, this one, we have plenty of people who uh, say, I I'm sick, but I'm, I'm coming in. <laughs> we tell them, no, 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 please stay at home, right? We, we don't want them to come in. We don't want them to, to come in and get the rest of us sick. And uh, especially with COVID now, we're gonna be better set up to work from home. Um, but that's something that, that we you see very clearly different. Um, so, uh, and then the final one is, uh, man, I get to come into work today. Right. I mean, that's the difference. The, the bottom line is I have to come in or I get to come in. And, and I know there's some perspective on um, with COVID that, that people are like, you know, with 30 million people out of jobs and, and everything. It's it's a privilege to have a job. And it's something that's that's really hopefully has changed a lot of people's perspectives that they 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 want to say I get to come into work as opposed to I have to come into work. Um, so put, put down in the comments, um, kind of 
what uh, what do you do to take take ownership? How how do you take ownership uh, at your job or in your role? And it doesn't mean you have to be an owner owner where you own the company, um, but but how do you take uh, ownership um, in in your role at a company? So let, let's talk about that actions of an owner, right? So these are some actions action steps that they uh, that they can do. So uh, work to better each other. Um, they take corrective, uh, co constructive criticism well. Um, these are people who, uh, you know, criticism is never easy to take, but sometimes we have blind spots. And I don't even think uh, criticism in my mind is is really a bad thing, a good thing. It, it's just maybe I'm missing something. I didn't realize I was doing something to affect a lot of other people or one other person, and they're bringing it to my attention. Um, now, how they do that is is very important usually, but also how you respond to it. Um, the other thing with owners is I, I've seen a lot of renters who don't want to train anybody because that means that they may have a challenge for their job, right? Well, if I train people, what am I going to do? And if I teach them how I do it, what am I going to do? And and this one, they help train others. You may not be a great trainer, but you're like, hey, I'll I'll teach you how to do it. I'll, I'll teach you what, what needs to be done. Um, do it the best we can. And in the process, they learn things along the way as well. Um, so work to better the customer experience. Uh, first of all, with clients, uh, treat each client as our only client. If you are the owner uh, of a restaurant, usually you can tell when the owner comes in or who the owner is because the way they interact with the customers, the way they treat each customer one-on-one -on -one and they talk to them. Um, when I was the only one in Whisper for the first couple of years, I was the only employee of Whisper. I would go do installs and I I never told anybody I was the founder and CEO. I don't even think I was calling myself CEO at that time. How can, can you be a CEO of only one person? I don't think you can be a CEO of only one person, but uh, I, I would never go in and, and lead with that. I was just an installer and um, the people though could tell that after, after meeting with me, they, most of them would ask, are, are you the owner? Uh, because they could tell the way I talked about the company and what we were doing and growing and how we were trying to get people service and how we love to do that. Uh, and I think that's something that that whether you own a company physically or you own your role is something that you can definitely do and, and take ownership because you have pride in the workmanship that you're doing. And then we also use our core values. I talked a little bit about this earlier um, but the actions of our owners, and it, it doesn't matter that our core values are different than your core values. Um, it's your core values of your company or your core values of who you are. One, you have to know them. And then two, you have to use them to make decisions, right? You have to use those, uh, those to, as a litmus test to be able to make consistent and right decisions when you get into circumstances, one-off circumstances that, that don't happen very much. And that's what we look at when we say, okay, if I have a, a company of owners, um, those are some of the actions that my owners do. Um, but but really, what what happens? And you know, if you say, "Oh, this is great, Nathan. I, I want this for my my company. H how do I kind of start rolling it out? And what do I do?" Um, the answer is, it it all starts with you. Uh, you can't um, expect others to have an ownership mentality unless you do. Uh, you can't expect them to do things that you aren't willing to do. And that's one thing that I've always been willing to do is I lead I lead by example. Sometimes I lead by examples of what you shouldn't do. And sometimes I lead by example of what you should do. And for me, one of, one of those examples is as a company many years ago, many I say now, feels like many years ago, but as short as you know nine to 10 months ago, um, we were struggling with numbers of installs and how do we get our numbers up? And we were having a lot of turmoil in the company, and, and a lot of that turmoil um, was just growing pains, the size we were and what we were going to do and, and the personnel we had and CAF and all of our opportunities. And um, I stood up in front of the company, and um, I always wear, wear red, uh, and I stood up in front of the company and said, I, I have failed you. I ultimately, Whisper is performing poorly because I'm not performing to the level I need to, that I'm going to work on myself. And I was very non-confrontational. Um, I was I was against confrontation. I, I, I didn't want to rock the boat. I, I just, well, well, we're all adults, we'll figure it out. 
Um, but then I, I started seeing that that if I was going to allow that to happen and things to happen that way, that the company was struggling. We uh, we underturned every rock, right? We we looked at sales as to why our installs weren't they were. We looked at installers and everything, and ultimately it came down to that I was the one. Ultimately, I was not making the right hard decisions that I needed to to be able to do that. And it and it really took me knowing who I am to be able to do that. Uh, I feel that I have a, a pretty good self awareness of where I'm weak and where I need help, uh, but that wasn't enough for me able to sit back and say, "Wait a minute, I'm the problem here, and I need to correct a mistake or I need to change the way I'm 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 operating." And and it wasn't that I had become bad, right? It, it wasn't that you know I was great and knew what to do, and then I became bad. It was because as the company continued to grow, there were new challenges, and I had to adopt myself or adapt myself to be able to to make those changes, to be the leader that Whisper needed me to be. And, and I was behind. I had, I had reached the ceiling. If you if you do EOS, that's you know inevitable that you reach a ceiling. And and I had I had hit that ceiling as a person. Um, so I came in and apologized to the company and said I was going to get a lot better at it. And here's the things I was doing. And, and one of those things I was doing, and the biggest thing I was doing, other than wearing a blue shirt versus a red shirt, because I wanted to signify that I was I was changed. Um, was that I developed a strong core. Um, this is something we've talked about in our leadership um, part zero, um, that that core, my worldview and my identity and my principles, those are those are something I started working on uh, with David Deck, who was in our, our last video we had and with Built to Lead. And, and those allowed me to be stronger as to who I am and shift my worldview from conflict is not good to, no, I'm not having conflict with the person. I am sticking to my beliefs and my vision for Whisper, and I'm going to stand up for that vision, and I'm going to stand up for my beliefs, and it's okay if you don't like them, but you can't stay at Whisper if you don't follow what we want uh, and, and the vision we have, and you don't fit into our core values. So this is something that that has really set me on that path, and it was it was hard for me to get through. It was years for me to one identify I had hit the ceiling, and two be able to to come to grips with I was the problem and, and working through that. And now we're we're, we're taken off uh, like a rocket ship again. Super super exciting. I've made some of those hard decisions that I need to make, and it was all because of that worldview, identity, and principles, that core that I have to understand who I am. And this is something that you, as you'll see, this is going to be a common thing through a lot of our our um, our discussions here and our, our different broadcasts that working on your core, becoming a stronger leader, uh, whether you're a leader by title or a leader by position or just a, a leader of your family uh, is super, super important. So we're offering this to to anyone out there. If, you, if you're if you watching this and you want to send a, a, an email to the info at whisperuniversity.com, um, Whisper is going to be setting up a core building exercises with our company, uh, with all of our employees, and we keep hiring people. So we're going to do a new one every quarter. Uh, and then we're going to do some normal practices. Uh, and then we're going to work on our opus, which is your your love of work, your your statement of your love of work. Um, we're opening those up to anybody and everybody who wants to wants to uh, be part of those. All you have to do is email into that email, and we'll get you on the list when we start the next uh, class here shortly. And um, we'll all go together. And uh, there's no cost to it. You just get to join virtually. And uh, we'll see how it all goes and see what this turns into. So it should be should be a lot of fun. Um, so today I want to leave you with this. This is something that Built to Lead um, uses with engagement. So I, I think it's an old proverb, uh, but they added to it. So it says, tell me I may listen. Teach me I may learn. Involve me I will do. And that's usually where it stops, right? So if you involve somebody, uh, involve somebody uh, I will do. Engage me and I will grow. And I think that's so important that we think about that is that, you know, we at Whisper here, we're building people and, and their job functions, yes, are important, but them as a person are super important. And we want to engage our employees through ensuring that they understand our core values. They have a core, they understand who they are, and that they know that their core overlaps with Whisper's core. Uh, and if that's the case, then we get them into something they're passionate about. Right. And if you think about people who are passionate, 
you know, those are people you would say, yeah, they're definitely engaged, right? Because they won't stop talking about this or they this or that. That's what we want with our engaged employees is is to grow them into the roles where they need to be um, for for what they're passionate about. Uh, and it starts with working on your core and then going through to your opus. Uh, so here's a couple books that I've put up here. All of these have to do with engagement or ownership. They're all actually really, really good. I think my favorite one on here out of all these is, is still The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Um, but Multipliers is an amazing book as well. Uh, really, really good. Uh, and The Radical Candor. Um, but if you like if you like uh, military stories, extreme ownership is, is really good too. So um, they're all good. I wouldn't have them up here if they weren't good. Um, but uh, with that, uh, we'll see if anybody has any other questions or anything like that. And um, I'm not sure we do. So maybe we'll have to figure out how to make these a little more interactive. But uh, hopefully you learned something. Please join us for the, the, the Build to Lead once we get that rolling out. Get your information in. You won't be spammed. We're not, we're not harvesting emails. Uh, this is just our way of saying, hey, we're going to do it anyway with our employees, and we might as well open up to everybody else and let them be part of it as well. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for joining in and enjoy the rest of uh, the rest of your week.